Well, welcome to the Collector Car Podcast. I'm very excited about this episode, mostly because I have two really cool guests to talk about a really cool subject matter. So I'd like to welcome Myron Vernis. Myron, how you doing? Good, Greg. How you doing? Good, good. And Mark Brinker. Mark, how are you? I'm good. Thank you for having us. Yeah, this is really exciting for me. You guys wrote this incredible kind of anthology of Japanese domestic market cars, JDM cars, a book called A Quiet Greatness, and it is unbelievable. I don't have a set, but I'm going to get a set. But just looking at your website and the stuff that's in there, the photographs and everything, it looks like it's a milestone kind of publication. So I just think it's amazing. I'm glad you're on the podcast And I know Myron fairly well. Mark, I don't know you. So let's start with Mark. Mark, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and how this came to be? And then I know Myron will pop in there as need be, obviously. So uh, I'm originally from Long Island, uh, went to school in New Orleans, uh, starting with college. And uh, I'm I'm an orthopedic surgeon, did all my training at Tulane, Um, grew up you know, a a car lunatic, uh, had, you know, Hot Wheels and Matchbox and, you know, uh, did not enjoy reading any kind of books other than car magazines as a kid. Um, But, you know, was always interested in cars. Uh, My dad liked, you know, having a sporty car, but nothing collectible. He wasn't in the hobby, Um, but he, he enjoyed cars and we used to go driving and, you know, you'd get a new Eldorado or something like that. And we'd go riding around. But um, I think the the bug probably came from the movies, you know, Tony Curtis oh. movies and racing movies and um, always interested in cars from the 50s, sports cars from the 50s. Um, my first car was a Datsun and loved it. Um didn't collect Japanese cars for a long time, but then sort of rediscovered Japanese cars a little bit later, about the same time as Myron. And then we just sort of fed off each other's uh, <laughs> disease. And, uh, and I, you know, the rest is history. So you're, yeah, yeah. you're his enabler and he's your enabler is what I'm hearing. I think so. Yeah, I think so. We're codependent Japanese car collectors. Okay, well, and, and and competitive sometimes too. You know, who, who would get the first Colt Gallant GTO MR, the first R four thirty two? Well, tell us. So, Myron, how did you guys get to know each other? Like, did you meet at a car show? I would assume. Yeah, no, not at all. I I'm in Akron, Ohio. Uh, Mark's in Houston. Uh, we met through love of kind of obscure cars, um, mm. European car. I think with the market was a Deutsche Bene that, that brought us together originally, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, we had spoken before then, but that's, you know, that's when the uh, love affair uh, began, I would say. Yeah, you could tell that story. Yeah, I, I you know, I kind of, my, my passion started. See, my, my story is a lot like Mark's other than the fact that I didn't grow up in New York. I didn't go to medical school. <laughs> I never, my dad hated cars, but we're otherwise, we're very otherwise, similar. <laughs> you're the same. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I always had a passion for cars. Uh, never had them around the house, but growing up, even my folks said, we, I lived in Greece till I was about five years old and we didn't even have a car there. But uh, my folks said, I always, you know, sat on the balcony watching cars go by naming cars and things. So uh, my first passion uh, really was with Porsche 356s. I really got into Porsche 356s because at the time they were cheap and available. Being in Akron, uh, there were a lot of cars here. You know, Akron, Northeast Ohio for the longest time had most cars per capita than any place in the world because of the proximity to Detroit and having the tire industry here in Cleveland being a big source for manufacturers in the early part of the century and, and, and suppliers otherwise. So I got into 356s and then kind of started seeing, you know, who were the 356 competitors and uh, came across this brand from France, a small manufacturer called Deutsche Bonnet. Um, kind of like, I kind of like the, the French Lotus, you know, very, very light cars, small engines, but did very, very well as race cars. And for some reason, there are a fair amount here. So I started accumulating Deutsche Bonnets. Nobody cared. It was okay. They were cheap for me. I was having fun. 
And then one day Mark calls me and says, Hey, I, I hear you've got a couple of these cars. I'd like to buy one. And it was pretty much, well, it's not really for sale. And then he told me what he was going to do with it. And uh, once I learned that he was planning on uh, taking it to Bonneville and setting a class record with it, <laughs> uh, I said, well, that's the kind of insanity that I really need to, to encourage. So that was really kind of the, the start of our, you know, more serious, the more serious part of our relationship, I'd say. So was there a Deutsche Bene record you had to beat or were you the first one? <laughs> no. So the way Bonneville works, first of all, um, there are vintage classes at Bonneville, but they all involve uh, American cars. So there's no, there's no vintage classes available for a car like a Deutsche Bene. So you're running in an open class, meaning a 2023 brand new car could show up. Mm -hmm. The trick is at Bonneville, they have classes based on types of cars and engine size. So this was a, a sports car and the engine size was J, which is 750 cc's or less. Right. So even though it was a 50 year old car when I started racing it at Bonneville, you know, how many 750 cc sports cars, you know, that are modern, can you name that? So that was sort of the trick. It's aerodynamic. And we engineered the heck out of the engine. We turned like a 30 horsepower motor into like a 75 horsepower motor. <laughs> um, right. So, so there was, so it, it, it broke the records for 750 cc sports cars of any type. Right, right. Okay. No, that's very cool. So did you compete against any Geo Metros by chance? Uh, no, but <laughs> Geo Metros were there. Okay. In different classes. I own three of those. That's the only reason I ask. <laughs> I, I, I think those don't qualify as sports cars. Yeah. I, think they're, I think they fit into something else. You're right about that. Um, okay. So we kind of learned how you guys met, how you, the passion that brought you together with the Deutsche Benets. How did it get into kind of the JDM world and someone said, let's write a book. Who was that? Well, well Mark, I, I, Mark, think you, I think you talked me into it. Is that what happened, Myron? Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly what happened. I'm, I'm glad you finally, you know, could work con, 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 concealed to it. So I don't uh, no, Mark it with the book was all Mark, 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 in addition to everything else he he's accomplished, he's also an accomplished author. He'd done books before. And uh, as we were adding cars, you know, we, we, we both recognize that in the enthusiast end here in, in the United States, there really wasn't much knowledge or recognition of Japanese cars. So, you know, we both recognize that, but the idea of the book was really kind of Mark for two years, kind of needling me. And then I finally retired and kind of said, okay, I'll do it. And then uh, six years later, we, uh, we finally, we finally had something published. So, yeah. So talk me through that. So you, you wanted to focus in on the JDM world a little bit. You both are passionate about it. I mean, this book is massive. I mean, it's four books, you know, and the quality that I can see of this is beyond any first time author would do. Obviously, you said Mark has some experience here, but this is a huge thing you guys decided to do and you accomplished it. Was it ever felt unachievable or do you guys feel I mean, there's so much stuff you're trying to educate people about like how did you eat the elephant i guess is the best way to put it well first let, let me just a slight slight correction it's not jdm not just jdm cars a lot right. of jdm cars but uh, we also cover japanese cars that were made for other markets right yeah all around the world um you know it really didn't start out it started out as the idea of doing a 300 page book uh the high quality aspect of it, uh, the knowledge, all that was very important, but it was going to be a 300 page book and then kind of going on. And, you know, the cars were, the choice of cars is very subjective. Cars that we kind of studied, we went through lists and lists and lists and we picked the cars that we thought were the coolest. Um, the big, the, the, the biggest issue, the reason why it got so big was really, it's, it's a bad example of mission creep. You know, we keep <laughs> discovering more cars. Right. And neither one of us, you know, could say no. OK, yeah. And if you would, could you review uh, the difference between kind of the four volumes that are available? Yeah, so it's it's alphabetical, right? So we it's alphabetical by manufacturer. And then within each manufacturer, 
uh, it's chronologic. Okay. And then where did the title come up? A Quiet Greatness. Yeah. So uh, I think it came up from discussions with Myron and I, Um, you know, the Japanese people are, you know, a proud people. They're generally quiet. You know, they're not, they're not, you know, chess beaters. Um, But if you, if you look at the engineering and the excellence in the manufacturing, they're great. You know, Americans are not quiet about their accomplishments uh, in general. Uh, As a nation, the Japanese are. You know, they're proud people, uh, but in general, they're understated and quiet. Um, And and what they produce is great. Yeah, and 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 especially in this country, you know, by by it was a very it it was uh, the Japanese made the conscious decision not to send us their really cool cars, right? They had a mission. They had a mission to grow their market here. And they saw the weakness in the American market where, uh, you, you know, U.S. manufacturers in the 60s and 70s were putting out some pretty crappy cars. Right. They're cool. They're, they're good looking. But build quality was pretty bad. So they basically, you know, their mission was to send us cars that were reliable, efficient, um, easy to maintain, um, but also boring. The, the fact they were still making great cars, they just weren't sending them here. So over here, it was still the fact that they were making great cars in the sixties and seventies. You know, was still very quiet here. They intentionally did not want us to know. You know, and also when I first saw it, a quiet greatness. What you what you said, Mark, is totally right on. It makes total sense. I was thinking because I'm always like in the collector car world. I'm always in the marketplace standpoint is I think of the collectability of Japanese cars has really gone through the roof over the last five, eight, 10 years or whatever, but it's still kind of quiet, you know, like, I mean, by that, I mean, the mass majority of enthusiasts aren't on that bandwagon yet, I guess they, you know, like there's still a big way to ramp up from awareness, um, appreciation in my mind. I mean, I'm, I'm learning as we speak, because I grew up with Mustangs, you know, it's all new well, to me, you know, it's, it's more grassroots. They're out there, yeah. but they're not in Pebble Beach and at Pebble Beach and they're not on television. Right. But, you know, there's no shortage of Japanese cars enthusiasts. And, you know, when we say Japanese cars enthusiasts, it's kind of an interesting thing because we don't talk about American car enthusiasts, right? I mean, we talk about Ford enthusiasts or Chevy enthusiasts. We, we sort of lumped Japanese enthusiasts together, but there's there's people who collect Hondas that could care less about Mitsubishi's, right? And you know, and there's Nissan only collectors. So we've sort of you know smashed this all together as you know, okay, you either love or don't love Japanese cars, but it's really you know like Porsche collectors, right? They're they're collecting Porsche, not German cars, right? right? So yeah, and uh, and there, and there and there are even you know to take it away from the brands. I mean, there are people who just care about race cars and people who just care about you know powerful cars and then street or just cars skylines co- or right. just <laughs> right. Yeah, so I'm looking on your website here, and I I just wanted to call out some of the big buckets of stuff that you do cover. Um, you cover the most stunning Japanese autos ever made. You cover. Japanese motorsport heritage. You cover technical specifications, which is just really amazing. Looks like some period, uh, you know, drawings there, charts and deep detail, the best photography, uh, the heritage of the cars. I mean, it's a lot of stuff that you're covering in here. And and I, I wonder if you could just pull out maybe one or two or three of your favorite either cars that you covered or, you know, uh, stories or history or something that you put in this book that maybe you didn't know prior to even writing, you know, like a, a, a an, advent, an adventure of discovery, you know, is there something that kind of popped while you were writing this that you're like, wow, I, I love these cars forever. I didn't know that. Or I, a new appreciation possibly. Well, I'll start. So I knew, I knew that Japanese cars had been successful uh, racing like in SCCA. And I, and I knew they had some success in the world rally championship series, but I, I didn't really appreciate you know, the the width, girth, and depth of the success, um, you know, being ultimate champions in lots of different uh, endeavors. And when we started the book, 
Byron and I had conversations about, you know, should we even include racing? You know, this is supposed to be a book about cars that you can collect, Japanese cars that you can collect and have fun with, you know, not, not race cars, but the race cars, it turns out is a really big part of the story. And so Myron and I, you know, as we went through this realized, so there's, I don't know, over a hundred competition, way more than over a hundred competition photos um, in the book. And, um, you know, that's the competition is what got a lot of people excited uh, about these cars. You know, the kids that played video games, a lot of them were excited about some of these models because of their racing heritage. Even if it's a different car than you actually can drive on the street, um, you know, that that's part of the excitement. So that's I, I knew somewhat about it, but I didn't realize until we got into it how successful they'd been. Right. Okay. Yeah, for, for me, for me, it was um, the involvement of a lot of the great Italian designers of the time mm. with the Japanese manufacturers, um, you know, Zagato and Michelotti and Gijaro, uh, all were doing work for, uh, for manufacturers and not just the big manufacturers, even the smaller ones like Hino, <laughs> you know, had uh, like Michelotti doing their, their work for him. And didn't realize how involved uh, the Japanese were with that. that. Those are names that, again, they're like way advanced from us here in the United States, even because they were using these great designers. And, uh, you know, for, for, the, for the Italians, it was just kind of a job for them. I don't think that they did a great job of publicizing the fact that they were doing work for the Japanese manufacturers. But uh, that was kind of the big revelation for me. And as a result, you know, you start looking for those things. And, you know, I, both those things that Mark and I found, we say, I say, that uh, the most expensive part of doing the book wasn't so much the cost of printing and securing photographs and things like that. <laughs> and all that stuff cost a bunch. The most expensive part was really finding cars that we liked, that we didn't know anything about, and then having to go out and buy them <laughs> because we, <laughs> we love them so much. Yeah, right, actually, and, the, the pub and the publishers didn't give us any budget to buy cars. The publishers, of course, being our wives. <laughs> <laughs> well you know that's a really good point or a, a good follow-up is as you research this because i know myron has some japanese cars and I, i'm assuming mark you do as well is there a car you weren't that familiar with that you just had to pursue and if so did you find one and buy it um so um one of the cars I bought, I was familiar with, but I wasn't, I didn't know as much as obviously I did after we started researching and writing. That's the twin cam 240 Z, the, mm. the Z432. A 432 stands for four valves per cylinder, three carburetors, two camshafts. So it's a twin cam 240 Z. Um, and I, I wound up buying one of those while we were writing. Um, on the on the even less well known side, um, there's a there's a Toyota MR2 that was bodied by Zagato. That's a, that's wow. a totally wild looking thing. Um, I, you know, I think it's a love it or hated thing, but I, most most people that I've shown pictures of it to uh, love it. I, I say show pictures to because it won't be legal in the United States till 2026. So I have it on mothballs in Canada. And that's that's sort of a, a window into the lunacy of uh, Myron and my collecting. You know, I bought that car three years ago, you know, and it, it, it won't be, you know, I bought it like seven years before it would be legal in the United States. <laughs> now, do they make a lot of those or is it like a special edition? You know, they say they made a hundred, but, uh, you know, I've been looking, you know, but, that's another thing. If you have one, then you have to, you know, find another one. You need a pair of them, right? I, Myron and I both have cars where, you know, if one is good, you know, and it's really rare, let's go find another one. Um, the, the, the reported number is 100, but I, I don't think they built 100 of them. But nope. I don't know. Yeah. How about for you, Myron? Yeah, for me, and it's a really similar story. For me, it had to be the Autex Zagato, Autex Zagato Stelvio AZ1. 
um, which was going to be the Halo the car. Gullwing door car? No, it's not a Gull. That's that's an that's an AZ one also. Very good. That's an Auto Zam. <laughs> Got one of those too, but that, that's that's a whole different story. Uh, no, the Autex Zagato, when uh, Nissan decided in the late 80s that they were going to set up a performance division similar to like Mercedes AMG called Autec, they took the guy who was responsible for their GTR program, made him the president of Autec, and they decided to do uh, a Halo car. They wanted a Halo car to roll out the, uh, the introduction. So the plan in 1989 was to build 200 of these cars that were basically Nissan Leopards, uh, which we later got in the United States as the infinity M 30, but take that mm. chassis, um, tune it like again, AMG would be to Mercedes as far as, you know, the uh, high performance suspension, tuning the engine to go from 200 horsepower to like 320 horsepower, and then send those chassis to Italy and have Zagato body. Um, and they put, uh, it, it's kind of, kind of a controversial design. It's got giant wing pods, uh, on the front hood with mirrors in them. And, you know, it's not, it's not to everybody's taste, but again, similar thing. They were going to build 200. Um, the Japanese bubble economy just happened to conveniently crash right about the same time. The cars were priced at $160,000. Wow. So they published that 104 got built as far as we can tell about 88 got built. So same thing. I, I found one had the only one in the United States and one popped up about a year later and, like Mark said, had to buy that too. <laughs> so, uh, for my yeah. list, looking for a third. Yeah, yeah, yeah third. that's right. Yeah. yeah. Well, for my listeners that might not be familiar with Myron, uh, specifically because I know you a little better, Myron. Myron's quite the car guy. Uh, we had lunch, I don't know, a month or month and a half ago or so, and we jump in. What what was the car that we took? You know, Greg. I wish I could tell you. It was uh, your well, Infinity well, convertible. Oh, oh, the convertible. Yeah, that my winter car. Yeah, Infinity okay. M30, M30 convertible. Yeah. And, and what year is that? Uh, 91. And 91. Uh, the, conver I, the convertible's were built only for the U.S. market. Okay. And what I thought was really interesting is I think there was a, a new, I don't know, Bronco or something at your place when I got back. I'm like, oh, is that yours? He's like, no, this is the newest car I own. It's a 1990 <laughs> Infinity. <laughs> so I thought yeah. that was really cool. Well, you know, that's changed since then because like Mark's uh, MR2 is a Gato bodied MR2 as a result of the book. And it's not in the book. I found that Toyota used Zagato <clears throat> on a couple different programs like this. And I was able to find when they introduced the Harrier, the Toyota Harrier, which we got in this country as the uh, Lexus RX 300. They, uh, they also did 250 special editions to introduce the market. So I took delivery of one of those. Uh, again, the only one in the country. So now I officially have a car from 1998, which is my newest car, That's and okay. and the only car I own with with cup holders. So oh wow, really, okay, really really moving close to the 21st century, jumping into the modern times. Well, right. I do want to go down one other little tiny tangent, but before I do, I just wanted to ask, what's the best way for my listeners to buy this book because it is so gorgeous? And just to be clear, you said there was what. 2,200 photographs in this book? 1,400 pages, 2,200 photographs, um, four volumes plus a supplement. Um, yeah, it's, and it's a box set. Uh, the best way to do it, the most convenient way to do it is online at quietgreatness.com. Uh, if you happen to live in Los Angeles, we, we do have a retail outlet at Auto Books, Aero Books, and if you're in Detroit, um, past signers bookstore. Those are the only two bricks and mortar uh, stores that have it. Like Mark mentioned, we, we self-published the book because we wanted to control distribution. So we were supporting what we feel are the two finest automotive bookstores in the country. Otherwise, all, all is done directly through us. Yeah, if not, I, if, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Mark. If I could just make a point. So we wanted to control distribution, but even more than that, we wanted to control the quality. We touched on this, you know, sort of at the beginning. This was, this was never a, a money-making uh, endeavor, and it hasn't turned out to be a money-making endeavor. Uh, our goal oh, wait a minute. Wait. Hey, Mark, Mark, our wives yes. may be listening. I don't, oh, I don't sorry. know what you're doing. <laughs> uh, the, goal, on the... <laughs> the goal was always to break even, and we are going to break even. Uh, wives, we're going to break even. Um, but we, we, 
we felt like the book had to be of the highest quality if we were going to celebrate you know this this area of the hobby it couldn't be a paperback you know it couldn't be a boring hardcover book it had to be every bit as nice as a Porsche book or a Ferrari book or an Alfa Romeo book because if the book screams mediocre then that's what the cars are so the cars are celebrated you know for what they are at the highest level and the book is as nice as any book that's going to be on anybody's shelf that buys this we also price the book really reasonably it's it's four volumes in a supplement plus you know a slip case that you can basically stand on it's so stout so it's a really high quality thing comes doubled box you know so it can it can withstand a nuclear attack um and we've had zero returns like everybody is delighted with the book and that has delighted myron and i that's awesome yeah okay well i appreciate you sharing that so folks can can check it out i need to get mine on order here quickly because i know there's only so many correct so once they're gone they're gone or will there be a second print we we've sold uh, about 80 percent of the print run at this point so which it's really that's exceeded our expectations we've had some really really great reviews which are very fortunate to have that have really spurred uh the sales um right now there's no plan to reprint okay no that's good to know well before we sign off i do first off if there's anything else you want to cover just let me know uh but i do want to ask myron about a particular car you showed me last time i was in your garage and mark if you have something a particular car from the book you wanted to talk about, whether it's a personal car or one that you think is really cool. I noticed the crazy yellow on yellow NSX, which I thought was really cool. But Myron, you're the only V12 Japanese car ever built is in your, or that model. You have one of those. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about that? Because I was fascinated that there was a V12 Japanese car out there. Yeah, it's uh, the Toyota Century, which was made just for the Japanese market, uh, made for government dignitary use primarily and very, very high-end uh, corporate executives. Uh, um, it's really the Japanese Rolls Royce. The, that particular model, that body was made from 1967 to 2017, um, wow. you know, with just modifications for safety standards and things like that. It was uh, sold with a, a V8 from 67 uh, to 1997. And in 1997, they came out with the V12. Totally engineered by Toyota and built specifically for that model, not used in any other vehicle, no adaptation for race purposes or anything like that. So it's uh, it's a really interesting car. You put it next to a Rolls Royce of the period and, you know, the, the century stands up, stands tall in, in, in any way. It, it, it was to the point where to work in the century plant, you had to apply. You had to be a Toyota employee for so many years and you had to apply to, to work there. And uh, it, it really is kind of a, a stunning stunning car from a quality standpoint, very sedate styling. Did but, you just uh, say it had three telephones in it? That's three telephones. <laughs> yeah. Three telephones, t broadcast TV, video monitors. It's it, it's pretty amazing. It's a, it's a pretty amazing piece. And actually... Um, the one I have was one was the one that was actually photographed for the book that lived in uh, Western Canada at the time. Okay. And uh, three years later, I, I was able to acquire. It. Oh, that's awesome. That's great. Well, how about you, Mark? Anything pop to mind? Just a car you want to mention offhand? Yeah. So one of the one of the nice uh, stories of uh, this buying frenzy that Myron and I <laughs> didn't plan to go on but did as we discovered cars and again we egged each other on like you know myron would call and say you know what about this car i'm just discovering this and you know neither of us ever discouraged the other one it wasn't you know it wasn't like maybe you should think about this it's like yeah go ahead press the button you don't get it i will right <laughs> yeah right so um so about four and a half or five years ago, um, and we were writing the book then, what Myron said about six years is true because it's not just the writing. The writing didn't take six years, but assembling 2,200 photographs that are high quality that you have the rights to, um, I mean, that went on for a year and a half with an Excel spreadsheet, you know, that never ended a, a wish list. So along the whole way, we were you know, discovering cars or even, 
even cars we already knew, we were just discovering new things that made us even more excited about them. So one of those cars was a Subaru 22B. Oh, yes. So yep. I bought one about four and a half years ago, maybe five years ago, um, when, you know, when you didn't have to be a billionaire to, to buy one. It was still, it was expensive, but reasonable by today's standards. And that's just an incredible car. You know, 424 of them built. Um, you know, when, when you've never driven one, but you buy a car that's been, you know, hyped to the moon, one of two things is going to happen when you get in and drive it. It's either like, well, I don't really get it. What's, what's all the hype about? Or yeah, I get it. And, you know, within 30 seconds of driving the car, it's, it's pure magic. And so that was, that was one of the nice, uh, sort of unexpected delights of the book for me is that I was able to buy that car and their price now probably where, you know, I'd never buy one. Not that, not that I don't think they're worth it, but um, I don't, I don't buy a lot of $300,000 plus cars. Um, <laughs> so, um, so that was one of the, one of the nice delights is that I wound up with one of those and, you know, I'm getting to experience it. Yeah. I only have one. <laughs> Oh, Greg, 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 you'd mentioned, you, you know, the values of the car are skyrocketing. We, we didn't do the book with values of, you know, monetary values of the cars in mind at all. It's cars that we thought were the coolest cars. So yeah. you can go through the book and you'll find, you know, million dollar Toyota 2000 GTs, but you also find $5,000 Mitsubishi BR4s. And so it's, and, and, uh, all treated with equal, uh, respect and, uh, quality. So. It's, like, it's not about that. It's about the, right. the enthusiasm and the passion. Absolutely. Yeah. And educating and, you know, mm -hmm. getting other folks passionate about the cars, you know, and enjoying them. I only have one 22B story, which I didn't think I'd ever be able to bring this up. But since you brought it up first, uh, whenever I travel for my day job selling candy, whatever town I'm going to, I always Google classic cars and I see what's in the neck of the woods or auto museum. And when I was up in Burlington, Vermont, can you imagine what I came across? Does that Burlington, Vermont and Subaru, does that ring any bells? Um, yeah. So I Google it and like, I don't know, 40 minutes away from my where I'm located, it's Vermont, like Vermont racing team or something like that. And I they had some cool pictures on their website. So, all right, let me check it out. So I go up there, knock on the door. I get a full tour by the owner. And I didn't know this, but Vermont racing team is the factory race team for Subaru. <laughs> and so I go up there and in the lobby is a 22 B like, you know, in the wrapper, you know, around, you know, cordoned off and everything with all the specs on it and everything. And he gave me a full tour with the, you know, the racing 18 wheelers, you know, th these three were going on the East coast. These three were going on the West coast, running the different racing series. Um, it was just really insane. So it was kind of cool to run into a 22 B in the middle of nowhere, Vermont of all things. Yeah, that's crazy. That's awesome. Yeah, it was really worthwhile. So, well, guys, thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate it. Thanks for sharing your love of Japanese cars by writing this book and with uh, my audience. Um, I'm going to order mine right now. Um, I really do appreciate your time. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks. It's been, it's been a pleasure. Look forward to uh, next time uh, we can have lunch and I can show you some more wacky cars. <laughs>